everyone. I am Mrs. Gunter. I am the school social worker here, and we have been very blessed, and I keep saying this over and over, to have an additional social worker. And it just goes to show how important mental health is, what a big issue it is, especially coming back after being home for so long. And, you know, this, this beginning of the school year for us as mental health professionals has been unusually busy. I'll, I'll say that we definitely have more referrals and a referral is basically somebody suggesting that their student needs mental health support. Um, we have had more referrals in the last week than I've ever had at the beginning of a school year. So it just, you know, and, and a lot of them are very, very anxiety based. And so we are very lucky to have two of us. Uh, that just means that we are able to respond a little quicker. Uh, we're still uh, uh, getting a lot of, of students that need our support. So we're really excited. We're really excited to be able to support students. And for me, anxiety is the topic I would consider my expertise, and that comes from personal experience, professional experience. It comes from a passion um, to just, you know, be just like a passion to be. Um, I have a student that's in the garden. <laughs> do you want to go ahead and do the mental health check if you? Yeah, I'll keep going, um, which is, you know, a great example of what our life is like here students need us, we just need to go and attend to that. Um, so Yvonne has a little garden attached to her office, which is what she was talking about. Um, so we brought this up last week as a check-in that we can do, any of us, all of us should be doing. Um, we could do it once a day, maybe in the morning, maybe in the evening before bed. Um, but the first question is just how am I feeling overall? Just yeah. taking a second to slow down and Think about how am I actually feeling? Um, maybe that's where you're at on a scale of one to 10. 10 being like, oh, I had a great day. I'm fabulous. One being like, tomorrow cannot come soon enough. Um, and at the same time, how am I feeling physically? So just doing the quick scan from head to toe. Um, if there's anything happening in your body that's a little unusual, maybe a knot in your stomach or um, pain in your lower back or stress in any other area. Um, a lot of times mental health can manifest in our physical body. Number two is the question, um, what's been worrying me lately? If there's certain things um, haven't come off our to-do list for a while or anything like that, something new has come up in our life. Um, number three, am I providing my body with its basic needs? So food, water, I know Yvonne mentioned in the chat sleep already. Um, how much sleep did we get last night? Um, what else? Are we, you know, safe where we're at? Um, number four, what am I doing to bring joy for myself? Um, are we filling our calendars with things that we actually like instead of things for other people? And number five, who's in my corner? Who do I have to support me? Um, who can I lean on when I'm not feeling my best self? Um, so just a quick check-in about where I'm at on this scale. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's important because as parents, we tend to check on our kids more than we check on ourselves. You know, I'm a, a parent to three boys. One of them is a freshman here. One of them just went to college and I always am worried about how they're feeling. And I notice that I neglect my own needs to make sure that they're okay. So this is important for us to do as parents is just like, you know, how we feel as a parent, how we feel impacts the way that we interact with our families. And so just being really mindful of where we are. Maybe today I'm feeling more anxious. Maybe I'm noticing that knot in my stomach. Maybe I realize, like for me, I know I slept four hours last night, which isn't enough. I know that I didn't provide myself with my basic needs. So just keeping in check, like how we're treating ourselves. So this, this session is something that, again, is very near and dear to me. Anxiety has been something that I've struggled with since high school. Um, it was my senior year of high school. I did very well in school. My grades were, you know, really well. I, socially, I did well. I played sports. I kind of felt like I had it all figured out. And it was about six weeks before graduation that I started having really bad panic attacks. And at that time, I didn't know what they were. 
And it actually got to the point where they were so um, disabling that I just, I had to stop going to school. I couldn't get out of bed. I was just kind of a disaster. And I missed that last experience of high school self. And, and one of the things is, I wish I knew back then that there was help available. You know, I wish I knew that there were people that can help support me through it. I wish I knew what it was. I didn't have any information about what anxiety was. Um, I wish I had someone to talk to about it. I wish I had been more honest with my parents about it. And my anxiety actually, from the time I graduated from high school for the next 13 years was very, very, very bad. It was to the point where it was very uncomfortable for me to leave my house. I didn't go to college right away. I didn't, you know, I didn't um, have a job. I didn't leave. I didn't do things socially. And this went on for about 13 years. And um, I kind of assumed that's how life was going to be. And then I ended up getting support for that. And, and one of the things I learned is that I'm so passionate about teenagers getting support for their anxiety because I know that there's a way out. I know that there are things to help them get better. Um, I used to say that anxiety was the worst thing that happened to me, but it actually turns out that watching my sons experience anxiety is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And my son's anxiety, they all manifest in very different ways. Um, one of my sons has very bad social anxiety. Um, one of my sons, you know, he would get panic attacks and the other one has had some like school-based anxiety. And my husband and I kind of joke, we're like, we should have checked in with each other before we got married to determine that we both had anxiety because our poor children have really bad anxiety. And, you know, one thing I wish I knew is that I wish I knew to just listen to my kids when they were telling me how they were feeling. I always wanted to have the solution for them. And I think as parents, that's what, that's our role, right? We always want to fix our kiddos. We want to help them, but sometimes we just really need to hear them. So what I wish I did for them, I wish I was just a better listener and a better support. And um, I wish I just gave them the space to validate how they were feeling. And I, and I didn't do that. And so that's something that, that moving forward, that's why I like these presentations, because I want to make sure that it's something that we're all doing for our kids. You know, we have 2000 students here. Every year we see hundreds of students with anxiety. So this isn't isolated. This isn't isolated to kids who have, you know, tough backgrounds. This is kids who have 4.0s. This is our athletes. These are our drama kids. These are our, you know, well-rounded students who are very social. I mean, anxiety knows no bounds. Like it doesn't matter what kind of family we come from. It doesn't matter how well we parent. Sometimes anxiety just happens. And so I'm really passionate about this because a lot of times as parents, when our kids tell us we have anxiety, our first wonder is like, well, I, well, I've given my kid everything. So why are they feeling this way? They have everything they need. So why are they feeling this way? And so just knowing, you know, first thing is that it's not our fault that it happens. You know, it's, it's not something that we always have control over. Uh, next slide, please, Kayla. I'm still figuring out how to. Thank um, you. So, <laughs> yeah, of course. So, and if anything pops up in the chat, please let me know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that part of it. Um, adolescence, this is like the prime time in life for anxiety to brew. Anxiety brews in the unknown conditions, right? And so there's so many things changing. There's so many things changing for teenagers. They're going through puberty. They're, you know, they're making decisions for themselves. They're, they're questioning things. They're trying to figure out who they are. Things are unpredictable. You know, they, they might be socially having issues. I mean, there's just so many risk factors that make teenagers susceptible because they are, you know, experiencing all these new and challenging things. Um, go ahead, Kayla, you can move to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know if, you, if you've done this for your kiddos, but one of the things is, is I always had a tendency to say like, what could you possibly be stressed about? Your one job is to go to school and get good grades and make friends. How could you possibly be stressed? And I've invalidated my kids' feelings of that, of like, you know, I don't remember what it's like to be in high school. I mean, I'm not that old, but I don't have like really fresh memories of it, but I know that I've minimized and invalidated the things they've experienced. School is different. And let's not even, you know, forget that we're coming back after a year and a half. That has definitely had an impact 
I don't know specifically what that impact is or what that entails. But what I do know is, like I said in the beginning, is we're getting so many more referrals. Uh, I think as parents, we get we get kind of a bad reputation of putting pressure on our kids. And we do that. I do that. You know, I want my kids to do well. I want them to do better than I did. I want them to be successful. Um, and in doing that, I think I inadvertently add extra stress to their life. One thing that I know is that most students are already stressed about school. And so when we add our own stress to that and we double up that stress on them, a lot of times they'll just shut down because it becomes very overwhelming. So I like to give students the benefit of the doubt that they're probably already stressed about school without me saying anything. And you might be one of those parents where your kiddo is just doesn't care right now. And that, and that happens too. And so even adding stress to that, it's like, you know, we're, we're making them freeze up a bit if we become a little too, um, you know, pressuring. And, and I know there's, it, it's difficult because we know their potential and when sometimes they're lazy or we think, you know, but sometimes it is anxiety and sometimes it's other things. And so thinking about stressors, it's like when I was in high school, picking college wasn't really a big thing. It's like, chances were if I applied to a college, I was going to get in. Things are different now. There's a lot of competition. Um, college apps are a big deal, you know, comparing themselves to their other peers and their parental expectations. Um, expectations of themselves. I think students are definitely putting a lot of pressure on themselves to be perfect, to do well, to go to a great college. Um, other are just, you know, conflict within the home. You know, maybe they're fighting with siblings or maybe you're not seeing eye to eye. And so as we're going through these stressors, I just want you to think of them as like things that pile up, right? Conflicts with families, that culture again of achievement of having to go to a UC and knowing in, in, in a lot of times students, their worth is very wrapped up in what school they get into. That's very stressful. Um, conflicts with friends, breakups. I get a lot of students who say they had a breakup and they go home and, and you know the family says like, oh, you don't even know what love is yet or oh, you'll get through it, it's not a big deal. And so making sure that all these stressful things that are stressful for them in the moment, we're actually validating uh, increased competition to get into those schools. You know, for, for last year, admissions was really tough after COVID. We had, you know, several students who had, you know, we thought would be like Stanford bound end up in community college because the competition was just so overwhelming last year. And that was really stressful. Um, One of the comments um, I just want to highlight, um, they mentioned just homework load, um, saying, what about homework load? My daughter has been up past midnight every night this week doing homework. Um, I'm getting frustrated. This is a parent. I'm getting frustrated. I'm sure she has some anxiety. Yep, absolutely. So that's and, very real. And it's the first couple of weeks too. So I know a lot of students are already feeling a lot of pressure from homework and also you know, the expectation of the future, if they're thinking, if this is the first couple of weeks, what's the next month going to look like? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm having a hard time now, what's going to happen at the end of the semester? But absolutely, homework load. You know, they can't predict what classes they're going to, what teachers they're going to have. And some teachers tend to give more homework. And so, you know, just keeping an eye on your kiddo and, and we pressure them, like go to bed, but they know that they have work that they have to do. So how do we balance that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Overscheduling, this is actually, I've had a couple incidents in the last couple of days of students who, you know, senior year is a big deal. So they want to be very involved. They want to take all the AP classes. They want to play sports. They want to join clubs. They want to get a job. And I'm, I'm kind of listing all these things. And I'm thinking to myself, like, there are actually not enough hours in the day to get all of these things accomplished. And so the students and I are always talk a lot about FOMO, right? And we have a, we had a session last year about FOMO, but that fear of missing out and they don't wanna miss out. But what ends up happening is their schedules are so packed that they don't enjoy anything. Like it is just like, so I work a lot with students on trying to lighten the load. And that's probably one of the hardest things I do with teenagers is convincing them that it's healthy for them that in the in the big picture that they're going to feel a lot better. So again, parents get that um, those thoughts that we're pressuring them to do all kinds of things when in reality, a lot of times our kids are overscheduling themselves. 
And that leads to that lack of downtime. How much time do your kiddos have to just sit back and rest for a few moments? You know, after a long work day, I literally love to go. I lay on my bed for about 15 minutes just to decompress. And I kind of wonder like how many of our kiddos get to do that, have the time to do that. If they're working on their homework till midnight and you know your kid has good time management skills, you know, there's no downtime and that's, that can be really, really dangerous. Um, sleep is something that I tell students all the time. There's no amount of therapy or medication that works better than a full night of sleep. Um, it is something that your body, your mind, you, you really have to take care of. And when your assignments are piling up and you need to get into the college you want to get into, sleep becomes less and less of a priority, right? So something just to be mindful of. And how do you get your kid to sleep? You know, it's kind of like that. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them sleep, right? You can't do that. And so figuring out, you know, how to support them in their sleep. And we'll have some more presentations about good sleep hygiene, how to support your kiddo with sleep. Um, another stressor is just, their self image. You know, I have kids who don't want to come back to school right now because they've gained weight during COVID and they're afraid what people are going to say. They are, you know, feeling like they don't feel good about themselves. And that's so stressful as a teenager, because we have to remember in our teenage brain, the whole world revolves around us. That's just a natural part of development where everyone feels like everyone else is judging them and looking at them. Um, and so all of these things combine plus the homework load, plus the pressure of just, you know, being a family member, being a friend, being a student, it just becomes very overwhelming. Go ahead, Kayla, next slide. I wanna know, um, there's a question about Cyber High in the chat. I don't know much about Cyber High. I don't know if you know anything about. I don't, that would definitely be a, a Miss Davis question that hopefully yeah. we can follow up on next week. Yes. These are just a few quotes. Um, I obviously there's no identifying information. You don't know what students say this, but these are common things to hear in my office. Um, I can't sleep. Once I'm alone in my room, the thoughts just come flooding in. There are so many of them, the students said, there are so many thoughts. I can't even just grab onto one thought. I ask students daily, what brings them joy? Like the check-in we did at the beginning. And this one student said, the joy is going to come when I'm a working adult making money, but right now I don't have time for joy. And that broke my heart because I know that, you know, when you become a working adult, it's not all full of joy. So they're anticipating things that, you know, might not even be able to come to fruition in the way that they hope. Um, Hi, Miss Gunter, not sure how much longer I can hang on. I was doing so good and I hadn't cut myself in over a year. Today, it's all I can think about. I told my mom how stressed I was feeling and she literally said to suck it up and you know this isn't a time where I'm like bashing parents because like I said I have said some very insensitive things to my kids I've even punished my son who I didn't know was struggling with anxiety because I thought he was being defiant and a lot of times anxiety can look like defiance when in actuality it's very fear-based um 4.0 student has missed five consecutive days of school you know, I reached out to the parent because the parent's like, this is all like emotional stuff. We don't know what to do. And the student had been having panic attacks. And since the beginning of the school year has turned in zero assignments. And so this just goes to show how anxiety impacts us academically, physically, emotionally. It can just really, you know, kind of uh, derail a teenager. Mm -hmm. We are the eyes and ears of our, of our students. I tell people that you are the expert of your child. I do not know your child the way that you do. We are the experts on mental health. And so we make a really good partnership when we're looking out for kids and supporting kids. And there's some, some red flags and, and Kaylee will probably be able to add some red flags in here, but some of the things, you know, it's hard to differentiate what's just teenage moodiness and what's anxiety or depression like how many of you have had your kiddo just in a bad mood you know and so how do we differentiate between a bad mood and maybe just like struggling with anxiety struggling with anxiety during the day is very taxing it's very exhausting um, so I'm always looking for mood change if they're usually chipper and you're noticing that they're in their room a lot more that's definitely a red flag um anhedonia anhedonia is a word that basically means like 
lack of pleasure. Maybe they, they had an activity that they used to love and now they don't care to do it anymore. That's definitely a red flag for me, withdrawing from usual activities, worrying, complaining. I have a lot of students who are afraid of getting sick, afraid of their families getting sick, lots of worries, lots of complaining, sometimes complaining about physical ailments, like they just don't feel well. So these are things I really want you to be paying attention to when you're having conversations with your teenagers. Um, this is another one that people will kind of write off sometimes as normal teenage behavior, hostility, locking themselves in their room. Some of that is normal part of development, but some of it isn't. Um, is your child fidgety? Do you notice them like kind of moving around a lot or just not able to sit still? That could be a sign. Um, some kiddos need a lot of reassurance. They'll ask a lot of questions. Am I doing okay? What do you think? Did I mess that up? You know, needing and seeking reassurance can be a, a symptom of anxiety, giving up, changes in sleep. I know sleep is a weird one. And, and if you're anything like me, my kiddo um, during COVID was going to bed at three o'clock in the morning and our schedules were so messed up. But so it's a little bit harder to determine if your kiddo is having sleep issues. Are they sleeping too much? Are they sleeping too little? Do they have a hard time staying asleep? Do they have a hard time falling asleep? Um, negative self-talk feeling bad about themselves, crying. Um, I get a lot of people who don't come to school because their tummy hurts. You know, they say, I feel sick. And a lot of times it can be anxiety. You know, there is an actual anxiety disorder that is school avoidance. You talk about school, you think about school and they have a physical reaction to it. Changes in appetite. How is your kiddo eating? Are they worried about their personal safety? Go ahead, Kayla. Um, there's one that I kind of wanted to mention in combination with the last slide with sleep. Um, you know, if they're doing their homework for X amount of hours until the late night and they're still trying to fit in time for themselves, they're trying to find that joyful time, which will probably push their sleep back a little bit. Um, I know even adults in my life will do this. Um, I've done this and especially using like phones or gaming to kind of uses a distraction that can be really helpful self-care in some instances, but it can also add to um, add to anything else that's happening because it's a great escape. And once that escape is over, then they're kind of back where they were. Um, so it can be really helpful if there's more things that they do for joy, um, more things that they do to calm themselves down. Um, but, you know, tailor it and using the time wisely. Absolutely. <laughs> I wrote these because I've said these. <laughs> That's like, really helpful. <laughs> it really, I really have. Like, you know, uh, again, back to like what I wish I knew before when I thought my son was just being honorary and being naughty, you know. Stop feeling sorry for yourself, you know. Calm down. <laughs> it's all in your head. Um, I had a lot of people tell me that when I was suffering with anxiety and that was infuriating to me because I, I knew it wasn't, I knew it was more than that. And it, I, nobody was validating that something was, was not right with me. Um, you know, it, we're trying to be helpful when we say things like you're going to be just fine. And in that moment, they don't feel that and they don't know that and they don't understand that. Um, this one again is common. We give you everything you need. What could you possibly be stressed about? I pay the bills, I go to work, you have food on the table, I just bought you a new sweater. What on earth could you possibly be so stressed about to be presenting this way, to be so upset? Um, this is my favorite one and I hear it all the time. And again, I probably said it all the time. People have it way worse than you do. There will always be somebody that has it way worse than we do. That doesn't mean that our struggle is invalid. That doesn't mean that our struggle isn't meaningful to us. It doesn't mean that it's important. There will always be that. And when we say that to our, our students, um, we're shutting them out. We're that's, you know, a lot of times I'll say like, my kids don't want to talk to me. They want to talk to everybody else, but they don't want to talk to me. And I think about the things that I've said, and these are things that have closed conversations. Why would my student want to share with me that they're not well if I'm just going to tell them that somebody else has it way worse? Um, again, guilty, guilty of doing that. And 
trying to be helpful. All these things come from a place of love. Like I want my kid to feel okay. So I'm going to say all these things, calm down. It's in your head. You're not the only one that has to take that math class. You know, um, I bought you tutoring. You should be fine. Like all these things that, you know, many of us has probably said. One thing that I also hear from students kind of similar to them thinking other people have it worse. So why should they complain? Any student who's first generation or anything like that, coming from a loving place, they're really worried about, you know, acknowledging the struggles of their families and making sure they're honoring that, um, which might mean holding their own struggles in um, because they know that their families have gone through so much to put them in a, a place where they can succeed and they know they feel that love from them, but they don't wanna share that. They don't wanna add to the burden that they yeah. think their families absolutely are going through. Absolutely powerful and absolutely something that I hear all the time. My parents got through all of these horrible things and who am I to cry about my B in science, right? Like what, what gives me the right to do that when they've done so much more? And if we can just validate what they're feeling, it's gonna open up the dialogue. We want our conversations with our teenagers to be open. I want my children to tell me things. Um, sometimes they don't and that's okay. I'm okay if they talk to somebody else but just making sure that we're saying things that encourage them to know that we're safe, we're a safe place. What could you possibly have to worry about? Um, sometimes we're on the other side of this and, and I tend to do this too, where I wanna take away all their stressors. Has anybody heard the term snowplow parent? They literally are snow plowing all of the stressors out of their kid's life. They're fighting all of their battles and they're just kind of bulldozing through and making sure that their kids have this perfect, easy path. That's also not helpful. We need our children to learn how to struggle, how to survive, how to get through things. Um, and so just knowing that that's also not helpful. So trying to find the middle ground of all this. Assuming anxiety is manipulation. Um, I've done this too. Uh, I feel like you're exaggerating to get out of something. You know, I feel like you're just saying that because you don't want to do your homework. I feel like you're just saying that because you don't want to do your chores. Like just assuming that I like to, uh, I try to assume the best in kids. Um, sometimes they prove us otherwise, but generally speaking, I really like to just assume that they're telling me the truth. Getting mad at them adds more stress, shuts down the conversation. Um, I'm not saying that I don't feel mad on the inside because I do. Um, <laughs> but you know, getting angry with them when they're having anxiety or, or what possibly could anxiety. Um, I come from a very large Mexican family and we tend to tell each other everything, everything, everything that happens with my kids. I call my mom, I call my sister, I call my aunt. I tell everyone that, you know, my son had a breakup today or, or whatever. And, you know, when it comes to anxiety, I've probably shared things with my family members that my kids didn't want me to share. And that's like a breach of trust that I'm really trying to work through. Telling others about their struggles, they're embarrassed. This isn't something that students want people to know because it makes them feel weak. So just making sure that if we're sharing this with other people, what our children tell us, asking permission and giving them a reason of why we might want to share. You know, hey, I might want to tell your aunt because you're with her on the weekends and I feel like she can be really supportive for you. So making sure we're asking permission. One-upping, I don't know if you want to talk about that, Kayla, one-upping them. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, similar um, in kind of what we've been sharing already. Just, well, I went through this or, um, you know, just invalidating again, just one-upping them, making... Yeah. You think I guess, I guess was bad, Kayla? My day was way worse than yours. I was like, how can we give an example? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even in that same conversation, if you're trying to relate and adding that, yeah. Oh, I can totally understand because I did this at work and this was really hard. And then, you know, yeah. while you're trying to relate, you're also steering it completely away from what they're trying to talk to you about. Absolutely. Um, and if anybody, I, my screen's a little cut off. So, what's that? Yeah. If anybody has any questions about, you know, different things that you've maybe said to your students and wondering if they're helpful or harmful, throw it in the chat. We're definitely here to answer questions too. There is one in the chat that I was I was going to wait until we were slip, uh, switching slides, um, but it was really important. So they said it's hard for um, my student tells me when they feel alone. I'm proud that they're able to share this and recognize this um, and share with me, but I don't know how to help. Um, and when I ask how I can help, they don't know either. Um, and it's tough. 
And I that really resonated with me um, because sometimes when we're at struggling our hardest and people want to help and support, we don't even know what we need ourselves. Um, and especially when they're students, you know, they're still developing. They might not know what they can do. They don't know how to get through it themselves um, while we're trying to help. Absolutely. It's almost added pressure. <laughs> I think it is. It is going to say it's kind of this that open ended question, because I, I used to do that to students like, how can I best support you? And they're like, uh, I don't even know. So maybe giving specific ideas like, do you need me to hang out here in your room? Would you like some space? Do you need a snack? Like and not being annoying and overwhelming about it, because I have a tendency to do that, too. When I see my kids out, I'm like, do you want to go get chicken nuggets? Do you want boba tea? Like, how do I fix this? You know, letting them feel what they feel but also, you know, giving them options of like, how can I best support you? <laughs> why, why is not helpful. Um, I tell my husband, sometimes I'll come home from work and I'm like, I am just feeling really anxious today. And he's like, why? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Well, why, like why? And why is, not helpful when it comes with anxiety because people with anxiety um, are already thinking worst case scenario in their mind. So if my husband is like, why, why? And I don't know. One of the things that I wish he knew was that sometimes anxiety just is. There's no rhyme. There's no reason. It just pops up for me. Um, and if, if I don't know how to answer that question, it adds more anxiety to me, if that makes sense. It's the first question we ask, we wanna know, like if, you know, Kayla told me she was stressed, I'd be like, why, what's going on? And she might have a reason, a lot of times they do, and a lot of times they don't. And so just acknowledging that sometimes anxiety, there is no known reason for it. Sometimes it's hereditary, sometimes it's just something that happened in the environment, sometimes we have no idea. And so just knowing why why is not helpful. There is no why sometimes. Um, a lot of times teenagers, one of the main things I'll say is if, if anxiety is really severe, I'll want to call home. I want to talk to the parent and I, I work with the student. And one of the main reasons they don't want to share with their parent is not because they don't trust you, but because they already know that you have a heavy burden to carry. They already know that you do a lot. They already know that you work. They already knew that you cook dinner. And the last thing they want to do is be an added burden. And so maybe if you're asking why and they don't want to tell you, it might just be because they care about you and they want you to be okay too. Um, another thing with why is like, if I need an answer to the why, it makes me feel like there's something really wrong with me that I'm supposed to know about. And I don't know if that makes sense the way I said that, but it's just very anxiety inducing when people are just like, what's going on? Why, why, why? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just feeling very anxious. Um, and on the bottom, I just put one of these things and I, and I say this in a lot of the presentations of this is how we communicate in my house. And this is something I've learned over the years is when my kiddos are upset, when they're stressed, when they're anxious, I ask them, I give them the options. Do you want me to listen to you? Do you want me to give you advice? Or do you want me to be upset with you? Not upset at you, but upset with you. Did a teacher say something that made you mad and you want me to like agree with you right now? I will. Maybe I don't believe that, but I will do that if that's what you need. So do you want me to listen to you? Do you want me to give you advice? Or do you want me to be upset at somebody with you? Because I could do that too. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you just need someone in your corner. And then yeah. here, sometimes for me, hearing someone else be mad, then I start to kind of go to that other person's defense. I'm like, okay, now I've settled down. <laughs> like my, my gas tank is empty. <laughs> yes. So I want you to think about a situation that you've had that was very anxiety inducing. It could have been a car accident. It could have been that, you know, a dog was chasing you on your walk. It could be that you saw somebody that looked kind of dangerous, like might hurt you or something like that. And you have to acknowledge like what that response feels like, your adrenaline response. For me, I think of a situation where um, I have a little tiny dog and I was taking her for a walk and this really large, scary dog was off leash and coming up behind us. And my heart was racing, my palms were sweating. I felt a little sick in my stomach. And there was a reason that I was feeling that way because I felt like I was in danger. And when we struggle with anxiety, we have that same physical and emotional reaction. And sometimes that happens for no reason. And so just knowing that anxiety can be so overwhelming, it can be so intense, even though there's, no, there's nothing dangerous in the environment. You know, and, and we have um, different reactions. 
Some people run away. Some people don't know what to do and they just kind of freeze up. Some people get angry. Some people, and just acknowledging and, and trying to figure out with their own kiddos of like, what is their stress response? What does that look like? Um, go ahead, Kim. There was um, a question in the chat about how to control like the amount of time they play with online games. I don't know if you have experience with this. Um, on <laughs> friends, um, it's like while they're enjoying the games, but it's too much time. Like we were kind of mentioning, you know, it can be an escape, but um, it's any suggestion like that ever evolving, like trying to figure it out. And, and just like all of you, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure it out. I have one son that that's how he decompresses. And during COVID, I was very lenient on him because that's how he was connecting with his friends. But now as we're going back to school, he wants to play video games for four hours every night and it's too much. And um, I try to get some buy-in from him and I try to like talk to him, but it's honestly, it's been kind of a struggle. It's been kind of a fight. Um, I've had to take a little more initiative to like make him stop, turn it off, those kind of things, but it's not helpful. So to answer your question, I don't have the perfect answer. I think every kiddo is different. Every reason is different. And I think if our kids don't have the same buy-in we do, they're not going to change the behavior. And what I mean by that is my son knows that he's been getting up for school a little bit late, which makes our morning stressful and he's tired during the day. And so one of the things we talked about together was you know, you might be tired because you've been playing more, you know, you've been playing later, you're supposed to be sleeping by this time. And um, actually last night he went to bed at 10 o'clock and played maybe a little less video games and actually told me this morning that he felt better having slept as much as he had. So I, I know that's, that's a, a kind of sugar coated answer because believe me, we've had fights about this a lot. So I don't have the perfect answer, but I'm still working through it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like this graphic of just about, I think people talk about panic attacks a lot and um, we might not know what they look like um, and kind of maybe how they differ from an anxiety attack, um, mm -hmm. which are different. Um, when people are kind of experiencing a panic attack, this is all happening within a couple minutes. Um, as you can see on screen, you know, nausea, their heart's racing, um, going from hot to cold, shaking is really common. Sometimes people aren't able to even get words out, um, even to like look at you. You know, I've worked with some students where they're, you know, experiencing all this and I'm pretty sure they can hear me, but there's no sign from them that they can hear me. Um, so I just kind of operate off of that. Yeah, and imagine that you're feeling all of these things and you're sitting in your classroom and you're trying to learn and, uh, you know, you're in survival mode, essentially, right? You're just trying to get through this moment. And so a lot of students, something that can be really helpful is when they learn what a panic attack is, what it feels like, that it's not going to kill them, that they're going to be okay, that they have a little bit of control over it. And those are things that we do in working with our students. I think that takes a lot of the fear and the mystery out of it. And so if you've heard your, your son or daughter, your, your kiddo saying anything like this, um, that they felt these things. I and mean, it's definitely a time to reach out. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is gonna require some help. Um, again, I'm a parent, but I do not have all of the answers. And somebody mentioned like, you know, how can I support you? Well, this was kind of gonna break it down a little more specifically. So I want you to think about supports as being either physical supports are emotional supports. And I want just some ideas of what a physical support might be. Like for me, a physical support might be to give my kiddo a snack, right? Or to give my, my kiddo some physical space. Maybe they need a little bit of space. That would be a physical thing that I could do to support my kiddo. Um, emotionally, like, and another physical thing, maybe they want a hug. My kids don't. They will not let me hug them, any of them, which makes me really sad, but that would be a physical support if that was something that your, your kiddo, you know, helped them regulate themselves. Um, I don't know if you could think of any kind of physical. Um, I'm also thinking of, if people are having a hard time in their space, um, like, do you want me to turn the lights down or, you know, maybe close the blinds so it's a little bit less stressful? Um, yeah. Maybe if it's a really loud area, 
we can walk somewhere a little bit more quiet. Um, so anything on that physical like environment as well. Yeah, I out. like to hug, you know, being like some people feel better like being kind of compressed. Some people feel worse being compressed. And some people just want space. Like it just depends. I had an incident um, maybe about about a month ago where one of my sons was having very bad anxiety. It was the first time we sat inside in a restaurant. And again, going back to COVID and how a lot of our students are overstimulated. There's a lot of people around, they're not used to it. And we ended up just taking our food and sitting outside and he felt a lot better, you know? So physically we were able to support him um, and just acknowledging that, you know, post uh, or returning to school is gonna come with a lot of that overstimulation, maybe more physical needs in their environment. Mm -hmm. um, Emotionally, what kind of emotional supports do you offer your kiddos? And feel free to add anything that you think of in the chat. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, while they may not have the answer, like someone in the chat mentioned, you know, if you're saying, how can I best support you? And they don't have an answer. The support we can give, you know, it's okay, you don't have an answer. I'm here if you do find that you do have an answer, you know, let me know how I can if you think of it. Yeah, emotional support could be just listening, just hearing them out, letting them talk. We tend to interrupt them when they're talking or try to solve the problem and it shuts them down. Like really challenge yourself to just listen. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and change Kayla. So just things to think about, like how in different, what different ways can we do? Um, if you're listening to this presentation and you're thinking like, wow, a lot of that sounds like my kiddo, you know, there are so many options available. And like I said, my passion is anxiety. My passion is having students get treated for anxiety. It's okay to not be okay. It doesn't mean that you're a failure as a parent and you didn't do what you should have done and it's your fault. Sometimes it's easy for us to feel that way and think that way, but it is okay to ask for help. Um, and that's what we're here for. You know, we, our goal is anything that gets in the way of your child being happy, healthy, successful in life and school is under the umbrella of what we do. And there are different options. Every family is different. Talk therapy is something that can be really helpful. And a lot of students, I ask them, I say, what kind of students do you think go to therapy? And they're like, well, ones with really bad families or really big problems. And I remind them like, that's not true. Talk therapy can be beneficial for everyone. Everybody needs a neutral space to process their feelings, whether that's your friend, whether that's your therapist, some place to be able to share your feelings. Um, you know, exposure therapy is something for kids who have like phobias. You know, when I was um, going through my really bad anxiety, I didn't drive during that time. It was very, very scary for me. And one of the things I did was exposure therapy. And that's just keep practicing that thing that's frightening. And the more that you desensitize yourself to it, the more, you know, you, um, you get comfortable. And exposure therapy is something I actually do hear a lot in regards to students who have anxiety about going to class. We have many, many students whose anxiety is so high that they stop coming to school. And one of the things we have to do in conjunction with their outside therapist is help them get back to class. Maybe on the first day, they just walk over to the class. Maybe on the second day, they spend one minute in the class. And remember those signs of like panic and anxiety are very uncomfortable. And so it's not intuitive for a student to wanna to be in an environment where they feel trapped. And so just knowing that we're here for that. If your kid is saying, I don't feel good, I'm not doing well, I don't wanna to go to school, my tummy hurts, I just can't reach out to us. Uh, we're always kind of listening from the attendance staff. Like, you know, if anybody calls and says, hey, my kid's feeling not so great emotionally, they're gonna miss out a day, we're gonna definitely try to reach out. But please don't hesitate to reach out to us because this is, this is what we do. We want to, you know, being a parent is difficult and having a kiddo with anxiety is difficult. And we wanna help minimize the struggles that you have in the morning getting your kiddos here. Mm -hmm. medication is not for everybody. A lot of families are very against it. And I totally understand that. I've seen it do wonders for students who have such high anxiety that they can't even do talk therapy yet. And so it's a personal choice. It's a family choice, but just knowing that, you know, I've seen it do wonders for people. I'm not a doctor. I don't prescribe. That's definitely something that comes from a doctor, a psychiatrist, um, but it is something that can be very helpful when we're dealing with extreme anxiety. 
group therapy, lifestyle. <laughs> What's that? I said, sorry. <laughs> no, just, you know, group therapy is a good way. We'll probably run some anxiety groups this year um, it, because it's nice for students to know that they're not alone. I wish when I was in high school and I was struggling with anxiety that I knew that I wasn't the only person on earth struggling. It felt so isolating and embarrassing. And when we put kids together who are having the same struggles, it can be very cathartic to just know that I'm not the only one. This is something that's common. 25% of teenagers like have some sort of anxiety disorder or depression. That's a huge percentage. If we have 2000 kiddos and we're seeing 300 of them, that's a large percentage of our population. You know, it's not a huge number, but when you think about what that entails and what they're feeling and how they're struggling, that's a pretty big number. Mm -hmm. um, and lifestyle changes, you know, making sure that they're exercising and eating healthy and getting sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kayla. I don't know if you want to go through this one. We're talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, I think we've kind of been the uh, feathering this in throughout as well, but like, how can we help? Um, first of all, monitoring sleep. A lot of you are aware of how little sleep they're getting or if they're sleeping a lot, you know, that's also the other side of it. Um, just being aware of that, that's the first thing to look at. Um, being able to listen. Um, part of that for me is also being okay with silence. You know, if they're starting to get silent, we, it's kind of like our comfort zone to like fill that space, right? Um, but sometimes people need a little bit of silence where they can um, get the words out. Um, not being demanding of perfection. They have a lot of pressure here at school. Um, even their friends who they're around are putting pressure on them. Um, so as much as we can take off as possible, that's helpful. Um, providing them healthy food, again, water, the basic needs. Um, encouraging them to spend time with their friends in, right? Their friends are already kind of can be a competitive space. So as much time as they can be kids because they are kids um, and just have fun. That's a hard one for parents sometimes. For me, even when my kid has a lot of homework and schoolwork that he needs to do and acknowledging that that social piece is also important for him. When he's in a better headspace, they do work better. So making sure that we give them permission to do things that kids should be doing. Sorry, go ahead. No, I love that. No, you add like such a valuable um, component to this, being a parent. Um, praising their effort. I think this is essential because we can often see them if they, you know, take a big step backwards. It can feel like all the work we put in or you as a parent put in is completely gone. Um, and it's not, you've set up such a big foundation. So even if they do take a big step back, they can keep going. Um, and they're not starting from square one, they're starting from square 50, wherever we left off. Um, talking to the doctor, if, if that's what's needed, you know, we're not able to prescribe medications or anything like that. And that would be the person you could talk to. And the doctor would keep track of, you know, weight and height and those growth measurements. That can be indicative of, you know, if things are not being met. Yeah. I always tell students when they're having severe anxiety, like, I'm going to make sure that you're your iron levels are checked, your thyroid's checked. Like I want you to rule out anything medically related mm -hmm. and then we can start to do the work. Cause sometimes it is something that's in, you know, part of their body or physical. And so we wanna make sure that we're covering all of our bases. Mm -hmm. I also like modeling, you know, however we can model which is probably the hardest part. Healthy coping strategies. Are we meeting with our friends? Are we getting enough sleep? Um, everything else under the sun we've talked about for them yeah I think that includes us like how many times do you tell your kids like today was a really really hard day and I'm struggling emotionally and I think I'm just gonna take a hot shower and lay down quietly to help myself like that's not something I say to my kids I do <laughs> that sometimes but when they know that that gives them permission to not be okay sometimes and it gives them a toolbox of things that can be helpful so be honest, model that. I'm definitely uh, somebody who probably is an oversharer, if you will, but it, I think it can be helpful to know that like, hey, mom struggles too. Some of mom's days suck, you know, and sometimes I, you know, need extra time to take care of myself. And I, I want to try to model that for them, that I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured it out. I don't have it together. And as they struggle, I struggle. I appreciate the encouraging them and praising them. Um, things that 
we might assume that they know, they don't think that they know. Um, they need to hear it. So as much as possible, being really verbal, being really clear about what you appreciate about them, what you think they're doing well, everything like that. They, they might not believe it. Um, so we need to encourage it as much as possible. I like pushing them to avoid avoiding anything like related to the exposure part, um, exposure therapy. Um, they're gonna wanna avoid things that are uncomfortable, but uncomfortable is where we grow as well. Trying to understand what they're going through, it's helpful. This is a completely different time frame than when anyone else has been in high school with you know access to social media, the pandemic. This is completely new for so many people. So our experience is not their experience. And don't take it personally if they don't want to talk to you, you know? I don't think I ever wanted to talk to my parents. Mm -hmm. um, but I know I talk to my friends and I talk to people at school about it. Um, so as long as they have someone that they can trust to talk to, and hopefully you trust that person as well. You know, we don't want teenagers giving other teenagers the most advice. But um, it does feel personal, like as a mom, like I tell my kids, like I have 2000 kids at work that want to talk to me and three at home that don't want to tell me anything, <laughs> my feelings, you know, but being okay with them, not wanting to tell me it's a hard one. I don't like it, but it's definitely helpful and gives them permission to get help somewhere else. So this is just how to get in touch with us. Um, I don't know if I can hear Yvonne, I'll let you share. I'm going to try and. Yeah, okay. definitely. So if your kid's struggling, even if you think maybe they are struggling, if you think you just want to consult with us and ask us questions, email us. Email for me is the best. I don't know about you, Kayla, for me, yes. email is the best. If you already know that your kiddo needs something, um, and I'm going to acknowledge right now, if you've already sent me a referral, we are so behind this like week with how many referrals we got. We are doing our best. We will get there. I promise you. Send us a, a referral. You go on the Piedmont Hills, the new website, and Kayla goes to students, and then mental health and wellness. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> That's helpful. Yes, and then here's our information. We do one-on-one -on -one counseling short term. Um, we have a service now, it's called Care Solace, and it's something that the district pays for. And what it basically is, if you have private insurance, what they will do is they will contact you and they will help you find a therapist or psychiatrist that's in your insurance network that's accepting new patients and also will see teenagers. Psychiatrist for teenagers is a very specific field and there's not a whole lot of psychiatrists that prescribe for teenagers. So this service will help you connect with the appropriate mental health professional. Um, and it's something where you just let us know, we connect you within 15 minutes of me referring you, they will call you and help you arrange that for your student. When your kid's struggling, the last thing you need to be doing is looking through the website for your insurance, trying to figure out how to get support for your kid. It's, you know, this is something that we're offering to you because it's so important that we do get you connected. So this is, um, this is how you get in touch with us. There's a link there where it says links. You want to click on that and sorry, and let us know um, how we can support you. Again, we're here for consultation. If you even think that, Hey, I want my kid assessed for anxiety. Let us know. We can do that here. We don't diagnose here out of school, but what we do is we can let you know kind of the, the proper avenue to get your kiddo support. Mm -hmm. And then I think in closing, we have a video. I love this video. It's a little bit cheesy, but what I love about it is how true it is. How if your kid had a physical illness, how we respond very differently than when our kids have an emotional illness. And so I just want to take a few minutes to... Can you hear? I know yep. you're sick and all, but are you trying to get better? Hey, look at it this way. There's plenty of people out there that have it worse off than you do. You need to stop focusing on all the bad things in life and just try to enjoy it. It's all in your head. I don't think you need to be taking medication every day just to feel normal. Don't you think it's changing you? Listen, you really just need to suck it up. Like, everybody goes through this, and you're just feeling sorry for yourself. <sighs> Why don't you just go to the doctor? Thank you. Your insurance doesn't cover the flu. Oh. Damn it. Man, that's broken. 
I need to see a doctor. Uh, seriously, I'm fine. I can get better on my own. A little silly, but makes a point of like, if we treated, you know, mental health, physical health, the way we do mental health. So just know that, you know, these are legitimate illnesses. These are legitimate things that our students are going through and we are here to support. And so I want to thank everyone for their time and being here. I know that, you know, being a parent is rough of, of a high schooler and we don't always have all the answers. And I definitely don't have all the answers, but just knowing that we're all here to support one another, whatever way we can support your student, things are going to get stressful during their high school experience. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone for their time and thank you for being here and make sure that you're back next week. I don't know what the topic is, but Ms. Davis will be back and she will definitely be able to, you know, help you out with those questions that as mental health professionals, we're not really too sure about. So thanks Rupert for helping us out as well to field some of those questions. So have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you everyone. <clears throat>